I'm Christoph, and we also have Michael. Hi. Uh, and we're software engineers uh, at Tessian. And we're very excited to tell you about Tessian and um, some technical challenges that we solved that we thought we, you could find interesting. Um, so the core mission of Tessian is to protect businesses against threats on email, um, and uh, particularly those threats that come from a human error. Uh, so the principal belief of Tessian is that humans make mistakes, that you can come up with all sorts of policies and training for your employees, but uh, sooner or later, you are going to, so someone is going to do something wrong. Um, and we should use technology to assist humans and protect them and the businesses. Um, so what kind of threats are we talking about? Um, a big one uh, is when someone accidentally sends an email to the wrong person. Um, so imagine you want to share some confidential documentation with your colleague, um, and but instead you you send it to a journalist who happens to have a very similar uh, name. And that's a real story, by the way, that happened to a company. So Tessian tries to detect that and warn the user before it's too late. Um, another threat type that is a huge problem for enterprises uh, is phishing and uh, highly targeted spear phishing attacks, where the attacker, uh, for example, tries to impersonate someone at the company. Um, and these messages can be can look very convincing. And honestly, I wouldn't expect any human to be able to always spot these. Um, but I think technology has a good chance to do that. So Tessian, the, the Tessian platform um, protects against these and other threats. Um, and it also allows administrators at the company uh, to have oversight and let them understand uh, the kinds, kinds of risk that the, their business is facing. Um, so, OK, maybe let's jump into the more technical side of Tessian. Uh, I'm sure you will be interested to hear about that. Um, you can think of our arch architecture a bit like this. So we have some elements that integrate with the, um, infrastructure, in the email infrastructure of our customers. Um, so, for example, it can be through an email gateway that intercepts all email traffic. Um, and then we have some services that perform classification of emails. For example, for outbound emails, um, um, it would be to determine whether it's misaddressed or not. Um, and we have some services that uh, use all the email traffic that we see to keep our models up to date so that we have a good understanding of the um, relationships between uh, email users. And most of our backend services uh, are written in Python, um, and we host them on uh, Amazon Web Services. OK, so let's look at the big box that says data store. Um, it actually does get a bit more complicated than that. So uh, this is actually multiple data stores that use different technologies. Um, and some big ones for us are Postgres and Amazon S3. And inside of them, inside each of them, um, the data is separated by tenant. So what do we mean by tenant? Tenants are our customers. Um, so it could be a big bank or a, a small law firm. Um, and we say that our systems are multi-tenanted because um, they're used by multiple tenants at the same time. So these services, they can handle requests for any tenants uh, equally well, uh, they, they don't care. Uh, but it's important that the data stay separated. Um, we hold very sensitive customer data, so any mix-up could be really bad. Um, so doing things this way has many operational advantages. Uh, we can very easily onboard tenants. Um, and look at this example. Um, look at this example of a service. Uh, we only run 14 copies of this service, but each of these copies is able to handle requests for any of the hundreds of customers that we have. Um, and this allows us to handle thousands of requests every minute. Um, but uh, multi-tenancy requires care. As I mentioned, we need to make sure that uh, the data ends up in the right place. And perhaps you can think, well, how hard can this be? Um, if 
say each center has their own folder, we just need to make sure that uh, we include the right folder name in all the code that needs to have access to it. And sure, we can say that we are going to try to remember to do this in all the right places, uh, but engineers are humans and humans do make mistakes. Um, and I want to say this is not to put blame on anyone. Uh, at Testion, we believe in uh, blameless culture. So when something goes wrong, we focus on looking for improvements to our processes. Uh, but um, yeah, bad stuff is going to happen. And uh, it happens to the best of us. So this really isn't a multi-tenancy issue, but I think from the technical point of view, it's probably very similar. Uh, so basically Google, um, earlier this year they had an issue when they stored private videos uh, in archives of the wrong users. Um, so what can we do to reduce this risk? Well, we, 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 here we have some ideas. So um, we can create abstractions that make application code simpler and easier to reason about. Um, and we also should have multiple safety nets. So we like to talk about the rule of two mistakes. Um, so we never want to be a single bag away from a major data issue. There has to be a few things that go wrong. Uh, so with that, I'm now going to hand over to Michael, who's going to tell you some bits more about uh, how we implemented these ideas in practice. Cool, excellent. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, hopefully, you can you can see my screen. So, um, so yeah, as Christoph mentioned in the um, in this kind of second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, Tessian's approach to to solving some of these issues. And specifically, I want to uh, address this um, this issue on the slide. Uh, that is, how can we keep the operational advantages of multi tenancy that uh, Christoph mentioned, but reduce the risks to uh, to an acceptable level? And uh, at Tessian, we think that uh, a reasonable approach to this uh, this problem is to make a multi-tenanted environment look single-tenanted to applications. And uh, to do this, uh, we've uh, invented an abstraction that we like to call uh, resources. And to um, uh, talk you through resources, uh, what they are and, and how you might use them, I'm gonna, gonna go through a simple example. So uh, imagine that you've got some app that um, is uh, part of your uh, services backend, and it's gonna receive, uh, receive some uh, HTTP requests that are going to be associated with uh, with some tenant, and uh, it's going to have to perform the uh, the business logic that you know it was uh, it was created to do. And as part of that, it's going to have to access these uh, these two data stores that I've called uh, D one and uh, and D two. Now, this is obviously a very um, high level example. So, to make it slightly uh, more more specific or, or realistic, we might uh, add this in. So uh, here, we're indicating that each of these data stores, as, um, as Christoph mentioned earlier, um, holds data for lots, of our different, uh, for lots of different tenants. So now this application is really having to do, uh, to do two things. It's having to first uh, select the correct um, tenant's data from, from the data stores, and then uh, also uh, operate on it to, to perform that custom business logic. And uh, ideally, we'd like to, uh, to separate out these, these two concerns in the code. And that's, uh, that's exactly what uh, resources are designed to do. So uh, you can see here that the business logic never talks directly to, uh, to any of the data stores. It goes through a resource. Uh, so, so in this example, uh, the business logic might call a method on, on one of the resources to say, get a file from, uh, from the data store. Um, and then that resource would go and get that file from the data store, but automatically for the correct tenant. So the business logic doesn't, doesn't need to be concerned with that. Now, uh, one very obvious question you might have with, uh, with this diagram is um, how do the resources know which tenant they're, they're meant to be targeting? Um, and to, uh, to enable this, there's actually a, a kind of a, a second component, which is uh, what I've termed here this, this request parsing layer. So requests come into this layer, they're um, parsed and, and sent through to this, this custom business logic. But crucially, this layer also pulls out the um, the tenant that the request is associated with and gives this information along to the resources so they know which, which tenants to be to be targeting the data store. Now, uh, this is, um, oh, or should I say, um, 
uh, that this this custom business logic now doesn't have to be concerned uh, with uh, with tenants at all. All the code that's uh, um, concerned with with which tenant we're operating on is uh, are these blue boxes, which make up part of the, uh, the kind of framework, if you will. So, so I would say that by and large, we've we've achieved that goal of of that first slide that I had of um, making this multi-tenanted environment look single-tenanted to um to this custom business logic. So uh, this uh, this is how it looks from kind of a uh, a diagram point of view, but all about some uh, some actual code. So uh, this is this is what uh, implementing this might might look like in code. Uh, I don't want to go through any of the the specific uh, details here, but what I wanted to highlight is that um, I hope you'll agree that this code is is relatively simple, and that was important to us because um, having a, a simple uh, interface for this um, this framework means uh, less bugs when people use it and also uh, increased adoption um, across the company, both of which were, uh, were important to us when, when designing this, uh, this resource implementation. So now I'd like to take a moment just to kind of do a, a slightly more deep dive on how we might create one of these, uh, one of these resources. And specifically, I want to look at um, S3. So uh, for anyone who isn't aware, S3 is an uh, AWS managed key value store where the, uh, the keys are path-like, or at least it's uh, good enough to think of it like that for, for this presentation. Now, uh, one of the first things we need to ask ourselves when designing one of these resources is uh, how are we gonna separate our tenant data uh, in this store? And uh, I think for S3, uh, a very reasonable approach is to have the tenant ID as the first component of, uh, of uh, any key. So just to run through a quick example, uh, let's say we have our S3 resource and uh, we've got a method on it that will allow us to uh, ask for all keys that start with a certain prefix. And let's say we use this method to ask for all keys that start with the prefix foo. Uh, the resource will then um, uh, do some work and uh, make a request to, uh, to, to S3, um, asking for all keys that start with this prefix. Uh, S3 will then uh, hopefully uh, fulfill our request and respond to us. Let's say it responds with, with these two keys, and then the resource will uh, process this response and um, pass, pass these two keys out. So essentially what's happening is we're prepending uh, tenant IDs to request to S3, and we're stripping them from the responses. Now, this looks like a, a reasonable solution that at first glance you think, yeah, this, this, this would work, but maybe there are some problems with it. So if we stick with our same um, setup, but now instead of asking for the prefix foo, we ask for a prefix that looks like this, and then we perform the same logic as before, we end up making a request to S3 for this prefix, which in some cases, it is possible S3 might interpret like this, which is obviously really bad because we've, we've now broken our, our tenant separation. And um, I don't think the, the, exact, um, the exact problem is, uh, is, is important here. The point I wanted to, to highlight was that even for this very simple resource, uh, doing this tenant separation isn't completely trivial. Now, to help us uh, avoid some of these problems, um, in many of our resources we've built at Tessian, uh, we've uh, used a, another AWS service called uh, STS. Now, I'm not going to go into the full details of the service uh, here, but uh, essentially STS allows us to dynamically create credentials with, with a certain set of permissions. Um, so in this example, we would use credentials that only allow us to operate on keys that start with the correct tenant ID. That way, if, if this error occurred and S3 did interpret this, uh, this, um, uh, this request uh, as the key slash five slash foo, then S3 itself would reject the request because uh, we wouldn't have permissions. And this goes back to what Christoph was saying about having multiple safety nets. Both the resource itself and S3 provide protection against, uh, against any issues. Now, uh, I'd just like to finish up by quickly mentioning some of the compromises the framework makes. Um, it's uh, not perfect, as, uh, as nothing is, and I think there are a couple of, uh, of, of notable, um, notable things. So firstly, uh, we incur a little bit of extra latency from uh, for SDS. To get these dynamic credentials, we have to um, uh, make requests to, to Amazon, and that takes a non-zero amount of time. Uh, secondly, some storage technologies are hard to abstract in, into a resource. Uh, as kind of a rule of thumb, the more complicated the interface the uh, technology provides, the harder it will be to, to abstract in this way. And then uh, lastly, uh, it's less flexible than, a, than an ad hoc approach. Uh, as with any framework, um, when using it, you have to uh, align with the, with the opinions of the framework, and that's, um, that's certainly true here as well. 
So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you very much uh, uh, for listening. Uh, also, if, if, uh, if any of that uh, sounded interesting, uh, we are uh, hiring and I believe there are links to our uh, quiz pages somewhere around here or maybe a link you can send. Thanks very much. Thank you.